First Timothy chapter 3 begins, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Well, as you know, we've been looking at the government of the church and in particular the office of elder and of deacon. And both these offices are filled by the choice of men from among the congregation and also by the congregation. Having looked at what an elder does and what a deacon does to stir up our desire to have them and prayerfulness to seek God for these gifts, last time we began to look at 1 Timothy 3 where the qualifications of elders and deacons are stated. We noted in general there in verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And so the desire to be an elder, and you could say as well the desire to be a deacon, is a noble desire. It's a holy ambition as long as you have it, not for your own preeminence or to seek some kind of praise or uh, great things for yourself. But it's a holy ambition when you view the office as one in which you may lay down your life in the service of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul there speaks of the office of a bishop or overseer and describes it as a good work. Very well. Yet at the same time, all who become leaders in the church or anywhere are not necessarily good leaders. And all who become leaders are not necessarily qualified in character. You don't need me to go too far to prove that for you. You just need to look at our political landscape. And we have leaders. But were you to ask, are these individuals qualified in character for leadership? I think the answer is, sadly, all too obviously, no. You step back a little further in history, and you know that nations have had tyrannical and destructive leaders. Had you lived in Russia from 1923 to 1953, you had, would have been governed by the iron fist of Joseph Stalin, a man who uh, set up laws uh, that would ultimately be to the destruction of his own people. Millions of people killed, either executed or sent to work camps called gulags, or in some instances, actually generating himself famine, like in places such as the Ukraine. Contemporary with him, Adolf Hitler, a genocidal warmonger, whose purpose was to create an Aryan master race and to extend a totalitarian rule via his Third Reich throughout the whole of Europe and no doubt even beyond that as well. But what's interesting is that both men, especially Hitler, came to power on a groundswell of popular support. As the Weimar public collapsed, Hitler because he had such support among the general population, was appointed to his position in 1933 as the chancellor, I believe it was, in Germany. There's a lesson there for us. Churches can have their own Hitlers. And the only way they get into office in a Presbyterian church is that congregations elect them to their own destruction. So not all who desire the office of an elder or not all who attain to the office of an elder are necessarily qualified. That is why it is so vital that we wrestle with this portion of God's Word. Because we need to base our choice upon the qualifications that God has set before us. Not the ideas that we may have in our own hearts. Because only these kinds of men are to be put 
in leadership of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we want to look at the first of these qualifications as it is stated there in verse 2 this morning, or this afternoon. It is an overarching qualification. And in many ways, all of the other qualifications are really this general statement parsed out and given more detail to. But here Paul writes to Timothy and he says, A bishop then must be blameless. A bishop then must be blameless. We could say also a bishop must then be above reproach. And so that's our theme for this afternoon. This first qualification for eldership, the elder must be above reproach. We have two main things to consider. And the first is godliness before giftedness. Now, a man who enters into the office of an elder or deacon, he must have gifts. We're not here to dispute that. We recognize that. A man who enters into the ministry must have gifts. Likewise, the qualifications that are mentioned here, and we noted this last week, are really virtues that should be in all Christians. No one should have a bad temper. No one should be a drunkard. No Christian family uh, should be out of control. These are all qualifications that each one of us here today needs to have as believers. But as they are stressed by God through Paul, what you discover is this, that the emphasis is on Christian character. Now that is something that I cannot overemphasize. If you lived in our household and you were a child growing up, you would hear this repeated over and over and over again. For this reason, that the Bible is obsessed with this when it comes to manliness, when it comes to being a godly woman, and especially when it comes to leadership. Godly character holds the chief place. Or another way to put it is that when you view candidates to hold the office of an elder, their piety is primary. Now we'll come to that for a moment. But let me just back up and apply that generally to you men, just as husbands and fathers. This is the chief thing, godly character. And let me apply it to you boys and you young men growing up, because you can get this terribly mixed up. As you grow from boyhood into manhood, you can get the idea that manliness is some kind of uh, macho thing. Right? And so you like to be well built. And you have a concern about your muscles. And you strut about for a time. And you, you like to manifest that strength. That's okay. The glory of young men is their strength. Enjoy it while you have it because it's soon going to disappear. But it's also vanity. If you think that's manliness, you are barking up the wrong tree in a bad way. Manliness in Scripture is rooted in godly character. Not machismo. Not muscles. Godly character. And what our church needs is you young men to grow up into men of godly character. Because you're going to be husbands and you're going to be fathers. And if you do not have, as the principal thing personal piety and godly character, whatever you do in your home, you will never be a leader. Never. So I want you to have that burned into your heart and into your soul today. Godly character is the principal thing. That's what our church needs. We don't need young men growing up to offer the church nothing more than emptiness and vanity. We need men who are going to stand up in their generation and be ministers and be elders and be deacons and be godly fathers. 
character is the principal thing. When it comes to the office of the elder, what we are looking for is a man of spiritual maturity who is well-rounded in the whole of his life with godliness. So a few things that this is not. Popularity is not a criterion. Popularity is not a criterion. There are people who have a personality that others are attracted to. It can be the dominant personality in the room. They may have charisma. They may be fun-loving. But I would have you note that nowhere in the qualifications of deacons or elders does God say this person needs to have a magnetic personality. He needs to be full of charisma. A bishop must be popular or a bishop must be funny. He says a bishop then must be blameless. He must be above reproach. So if you are popular, he doesn't say you have to be unpopular, by the way. If you are popular, if you are someone that others are attracted to, it must be for the weight of your character, not for the vanity of your personality. Is that why people are attracted to you? Because of the weightiness of your character? Popularity is not a criterion. Family history is not a qualification. You may have been born and raised in the church. And that's a good thing. Your family may have had a long association with the church. Not here in our case, as we are a relatively new church. But suppose our church continues for many generations. What a wonderful thing it would be if our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren were here in this congregation, continuing the witness of Cornerstone Presbyterian Church. That would be a wonderful thing. But in and of itself, it is no criterion for holding office in the church. Your daddy may have been an elder, and your daddy before him may have been an elder, but that does not mean you are going to inherit the position of eldership. But yet we find that happening in churches. Interesting, you, you find it happening in large churches like these mega church franchises. Mr. Olstein down there in Lakeland in Texas. Who was the minister before him? Daddy was. And Daddy was preaching the same nonsense he was before Joel was preaching it. Passes from father to son. You find this happening. I remember back in Northern Ireland, there was a desire of a very significant minister there that when he retired, his son, who was also a minister, would continue in the pulpit. And apparently that was tried, and thankfully the people said, no way. No. The qualification for coming into this pulpit is not that you're the son of the existing minister. Such a history does not qualify you, nor does it disqualify you, we are to expect to see intergenerational faithfulness, and it would be wonderful if one elder son grew up to be an elder himself, but the point is this, he needs to be qualified in his own life. He needs to be godly himself doesn't matter how many generations his family have been in the church for. It doesn't matter if he was born or raised in the church himself. Is he godly? Thirdly, church politics is not a guide either. This becomes especially a problem when there are parties in the church, like Corinth. Some were saying, I am of uh, Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Paul. Imagine there was an election for elders in a church like that. What would happen? Well, there would be a whole lot of electioneering and canvassing going on in the background. There would be a whole lot of uh, garnering support and maybe even tactical voting in the congregation. Especially if there was one individual and you didn't like that individual. Now, 
if you had reason to think he wasn't qualified, fair enough. But maybe you didn't like him because he actually stood on your toes and he, he confronted you about your sin, a qualification for eldership. But you don't like that. And maybe you say, well, I don't want that person to get into the office because he did that on me back then. And so you begin to manipulate or, or something in the background and everything becomes political and tactical. We need to remind ourselves that this is not a political process for members of the congregation to exploit to their own end. This is a piety process, if you like. This is observing the men in the congregation and weighing their godliness for holding offer, office. So politics must not come into this. Qualifications are what matter. Another thing here is gifts cannot make up for godliness. Gifts cannot make up for godliness. As I said earlier, there are gifts involved. Someone is going to need personal skills to deal with the members of the church. Someone is going to need practical common sense and wisdom to make decisions. And elders are to be apt to teach. So these are all gifts that are required. But listen, a man may have all those things naturally and outwardly and yet not be spiritually qualified. So you could have someone who was in the church and in the business world, he was a complete whiz. He knew how to manage his business and he was excellent even in managing people. Everybody wanted to work for that person. You might have people like that. You might have teachers and lecturers in a congregation, and as far as communication skills go, they could go and win the prize for the best TED Talk every single year. They have immense gifts. But if they're not noted for godliness, their gifts are useless to the oversight of the church. Now, that's a great tragedy. But it's also a reality. If they're not noted for godliness, then their gifts are useless to the leadership of the church. Now, let's step back and apply that generally as we did earlier. Just concerning you young men who are growing up, some of you might have brains to burn it. Some of you can be on a trajectory and you're going to fly high. You're going to earn hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe a year. You're going to kill it intellectually. But if you're not noted for godliness, then all of that giftedness is just a tragic waste. Oh, I'm not saying you won't contribute anything to life. In God's common grace, you will. There are many able and gifted people who are not Christians. But in terms of what you could be and what you should be, you are going to, in Old Testament terms, piss all of your gifts up against the wall. You're just going to waste them. Because godliness, godliness is vital. That has got to grip your hearts today. Piety and Christian character take precedence over everything else for elders. You could have men who are far less gifted but far more qualified because they have here what God says that they are to have. So that's the first thing. This, this afternoon to understand that giftedness is our godliness must come before giftedness. Just like McShane said, my congregation's greatest need is my own personal.
holiness. Secondly then, blamelessness, not sinlessness. <coughs> blamelessness, not sinlessness. A bishop then must be blameless. If you turn to chapter 6 and verse 14... you'll find the same word used. Thou, that thou keep it, th this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the day, uh, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 14, it's the word unrebukable. So blameless in chapter 3, verse 2, unrebukable in chapter 6, verse 14. The Greek word, when you, you parse it out, really means this that the person cannot be laid hold of. That's a literal translation. Not laid hold of. If you turn to Titus and look there at Titus chapter 1 verse 6, where the qualifications are given again, Paul says, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Blameless is there found in verse 6. But it's not the same Greek word. It's a different Greek word. And there the Greek word means um, not called out. So in our text, not laid hold of and not called out. What's the idea? Well, in each place it means that nobody is able to lay hold of you with or call you out with an accusation against your character. None is able to bring a charge against you that is stick, that will stick. Nobody is able to legitim legitimately accuse you of behavior unbecoming a mature Christian. A bishop must be blameless. Now, I would add this, that this applies not only to the present, but sometimes also to the past. And so you look at somebody's life now and you say, well... They have this testimony, but you look back into their life and you say, well, there were things there that evidently were not blameless. People were able to lay hold of them by way of an accusation, call them out, point to some kind of character that was unbecoming a Christian. The reality is that there are consequences to our sins, even when God forgives us. And that some sins, even though they were committed in the past, are of the order that they will still exclude someone from holding office. I'll give you an example. You see the next thing that Paul says there, a bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. An unlawful divorce would be an example of some sin in the past which would disqualify a man for office in the present. Now God may have forgiven him. Praise the Lord. But forgiveness does not mean you are now qualified to hold office. Someone may have had an affair in the past. Someone may have been guilty of child abuse in the past. And God has forgiven that person, and that person is in, in the church. But you're not going to put someone with that hanging over their past and their character into office of the church when this person is to be in leadership and have confidence among the people, and the world is not going to be able to point a finger and accuse them of anything. So this applies to the present, and for some cases, past sins that also exclude. Well, what does it look like? If you turn, please, to Job chapter 1, verse 1, you'll find an example there of a blameless man. Job chapter 1 and verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. That's the kind of man you're looking for. Now, God knows that Job was not a sinless man. But with regard to his testimony in the earth, we read that he was perfect, upright, he feared God, and he departed from evil. Another example would be Daniel. If you turn to Daniel chapter 6 and look there at verse 1 to verse 5. 
There were men, of course, wanting to bring an accusation against Daniel. And what a glorious thing. The only way they could bring an accusation against Daniel was for his obedience to God. What a way to live. Verse 3, then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could, not, they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then in verse 23, then was the king, or verse 22, My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me for as much as before him innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Now, Daniel again knows that he is not sinless. In chapter 9, he says, we have sinned with our fathers. He knows he's a sinner. But he says, I have lived in such a way that my life has been characterized by faithfulness and integrity. And God knows that I am being persecuted for righteousness sake. And he sees that and rewards me for my innocency and my integrity. We need to be able to say that kind of thing as Christians. Elders in the church must be able to say it. And men and women in the church must be able to say it about the elder. This does not mean that nobody is going to be accused. I would have you note in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is accused. And it's a very serious thing. But the accusations must be scripturally invalid. That's the case. So you can have people in the church come and say stuff about you, but if it's scripturally invalid, you're fine. You can have the world say whatever they like about believers for their obedience to God. You know that they're unloving, that they're bigots and all the rest of it. That's fine. That's actually the commendation often of God. So accusations will come, but accusations of behavior unbecoming mature Christian profession must not be able to stick. So then, blamelessness is not sinlessness. Why do I emphasize that? Because there are two problems either side of the truth. The one problem is, you hear that an elder must be blameless, and you imagine that the bar is so impossibly high that no one could ever be an elder. Because you say, well, you know, there are many good men in the church, but I'm not sure I would call any of them blameless. Well, it doesn't say faultless. It doesn't say faultless. It says blameless. So that's one problem. We set the bar in our minds so high that it's like we're looking for perfection. We're never going to find it. Then the other thing that happens is that this statement is used to set the bar unlawfully low. I remember being in a church court and we were discussing the qualifications of one individual for the ministry. And as the, the discussion continued... And one was making the point he doesn't fit this qualification right now. Someone else in the church court replied, yeah, but none of us meet these qualifications. He says, look at the first one. A bishop must be blameless. Are any of you blameless? To which I replied, you better be. You better be or you need to resign. Because... God says he must be blameless. Now what the man was doing was thinking that this meant we had to be blameless before God, you see. And he was saying, well, none of us are blameless. None of us are blameless before God. We can't meet this qualification. And then the idea was to dumb down the other qualifications as well. Wrong. 
It confuses blamelessness before God, which is sinlessness, with blamelessness before men, which has to do with having a consistent public Christian testimony. So all the men in this congregation are going to have faults. All the elders that you will elect to office will have faults. But here's the key. Their faults must not be of the order that they can be charged with public scandal. Blamelessness and outward observable conduct. So blamelessness is not sinlessness. Secondly, they are irreproachable, but irreproachable is not unapproachable. What am I aiming at here? Well, in some people's minds, they look at the minister or they look at the elder as almost this person who is in a different realm and you can barely go near to that person to approach him. Now, I will say I haven't seen that in America. It is a problem, and it has been a problem, particularly in the last 200 years in Scotland. That's the minister. Oh, you wouldn't knock on his door. That's the minister. If he speaks to you, well, you shake his hand and that's all well and good. But there's this kind of, he's the holy man. And then you have elders and they would sit up in the elders box. And some of these men were remarkably godly. But the idea of the congregation was almost this. They were intimidated by their idea of the godliness of the leadership. Elders are not to be like that. They're to be respected for their godliness. But being irreproachable is not the same as being unapproachable. It's not the same as being aloof. The elder is not to strike fear into the hearts of the congregation. He is to be held in reverence, yes. But it's going to become clear when we look at another of the qualifications for office that the people know the elder. They know him and he knows them. There's a relationship between the two so that he can pastor and, if need, discipline the person. Not by this aloof person. Not as if he's this aloof person with a big stick. <coughs> but he's able to get close and lovingly apply the chastisement and discipline that Christ has appointed. So bear these things in mind. Well, then, as we come to a close, all of what we've considered is vital for three things. Why is this important, that an elder must be blameless? Well, first of all, it is important for the confidence of the church. That is you. You need to be able to have confidence in your elders. After all, you're going to elect these people to care for your soul. You're going to elect these people, and authority is going to be placed into their hand. How can you do that? if there's disgrace in the life of this person. Here you are as a congregation and he comes to exercise the authority and yet his character completely undermines the authority that he comes to exercise. You can't have that kind of scenario within the church. So this is for your confidence in the first place as the body of Christ. But then another reason that it's vital is for the condition of the church. How significant is the leadership of a father in the home for the path that his children will follow? You say, well, it's huge. The the father is the one who sets the example. He shows the way. But so it is in Scripture when it comes to those who hold office in the church. The religious condition of the church is impacted greatly by the spiritual character of its leaders. You'll find this as you read throughout the Old Testament. Take, for example, what was going on at the end of the period of the judges, just before the birth of the kingdom. You have uh, Samuel and you have Eli. 
What was going on in and around the temple when Eli's son served in the office of the priests? They were engaged in sexual immorality with the women. They were exploiting the people by taking off the offerings for themselves that were supposed to be given unto God. They had a kind of racket going on. Now here you are living in Israel, looking up to these kind of ecclesiastical officers. What do you think is going to happen to the ethic and morality of the covenant people of God? It plummets. It goes off the edge of a cliff. So that the, by the time you come to, to 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Israelites are destroyed. Ichabod is written over it all. The glory has departed. Do you see the connection? The religious condition of the church is impacted greatly by the spiritual character of its leaders. A leader cannot expect, a leader cannot expect the piety of the people to be greater than the piety of himself. Now, listen to me on that. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. God, by his grace, is able to work in the lives of a congregation. But here's a principle. How can someone who is leading expect the person who is following him to go beyond him in piety? He, he's not setting him the proper example. That's why you have these examples in the New Testament, like uh, chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, where he's saying to a young man who maybe needs encouragement, he says, let no man despise thy youth. Timothy, people might see you as a young man, and they say, well, what do you know? You're just a young pup, and I'm so much older and wiser and godlier than you. Paul says, don't let them despise your youth. Rather, what are you to do? Be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and purity. Timothy, you are to lead this congregation even though you are younger than many within it. You are to be the trendsetter. You are to be the example in all of these areas. Don't you find Paul saying the same thing in Philippians chapter 3? And verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Don't follow the bad example, you'll be destroyed. Follow the good example. Who is the good example? Paul says, me. And the minister and the elder might feel very difficult speaking to you in these terms. But at the end of the day, he must be able, in some sense, to say this. Be a follower of me. Not do as I say, but don't do as I do. Because when you get into that position, what happens? You've completely undercut your authority. And very likely the people are going to do what you do and not as you say. So this is vital for the condition of the church. The religious condition of the church is impacted greatly by the spiritual character of her leaders. But then thirdly, it's vital because of criticism from the world. We are to be the light of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 7, and we'll look at this in weeks to come, Paul says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. He needs to be irreproachable because... His life not only brings reproach upon himself, but his life brings reproach against the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and against the church of the Lord. So here you have a minister or an elder or a deacon, and he has scandal in his life. And then you have the unbeliever, and he's looking at this. What does he do? He excuses his unbelief, doesn't he? I remember in air, I used to evangelize a particular area. The most hostile individual in that area was a Church of Scotland elder. Other people would be polite in rejecting our literature. 
he threatened to have us closed down just because we knocked people's doors and offered them gospel tracts. That man was also a drunkard. And he used to walk up and down the street in that community carrying his bag of liquor. He had all the evidence in his face. It was in his breath. And it was evident in the way he walked. Do you imagine what the people in that community thought when they saw him literally walk down the same street to the church on a Sunday morning of which he was an elder? What do we need to go to church for? What do we need the Lord Jesus Christ for? That's why this is so important. An elder must be blameless. The world is watching. Not only will people use it to exclude their unbelief, but it will cause the heathen to blaspheme. Listen to how Paul writes to the church in Rome, Romans chapter 2, where he's exposing the hypocrisy of the Jew. And he asks a series of very searching questions of us as Christians. Verse 21, Romans chapter 2, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thy God? Listen, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Because of your hypocrisy. There you are, pretending to be the teacher of others. There you are, pastor. There you are, elder. There you are, deacon. There you are, Christian father. And you're saying all this and contradicting it on the other side. What's the result to that? The heathen are cursing the name of your God. Because of your hypocrisy. That is why godly character is preeminent. We cannot allow the church to suffer in confidence. We cannot allow the church to suffer in spiritual condition. And we cannot allow Jesus Christ or his church to suffer the criticism of the world. Or to give them excuse to hold on to their unbelief to their own destruction. On ungodly elders and ministers quite literally send people to hell by their hypocrisy. Now those people will answer to God for their own sins. But humanly speaking, they're pointing the finger at the inconsistencies of those in leadership of the church. Now let their accusations be against us as they were against Daniel. Let that be. but never Romans chapter 2. Well, all these things are true of you as Christians. You as a Christian are to be blameless. Godly character in your Christian life is to be to the fore, but it is essential in those that we will call to office in the church. The qualifications are spiritual. Therefore, a bishop must be blameless. He must be above reproach. May God bless his word to our hearts. Let's stand for prayer.